I'll start by asking a very rhetorical question. How many people have a cell phone? Everybody, right? And how many of you have been using it uh, for services like talking to your doctor recently? So telehealth, telemedicine. Yeah, increasingly so. How about uh, digital banking? All right, so yeah. These are things that we could not have done a decade ago, right? So the world is changing and things are becoming increasingly autonomous and we're now using digital platforms to do a lot of the things that we would have used our limbs for. And uh, that's a good thing because it means that we're improving the systems, there's increased in efficiency in the processes, and that's good. But the question is, does everyone benefit? And is there equitable distribution of benefits to all people in a population? And so that's what I'm going to talk about. How do we harness the power of technology and innovation as public goods? If you look at this number, this is a very big number, 3.8 trillion liters. That is the amount of waste that is lost annually or left untreated. About 892 million people in the world still practice open defecation. That's a pretty significant number. In India alone, it is estimated that about $54 billion is lost annually in GDP. 200,000 people die annually. In South Africa, we have 2.6 million households that do not have access to safe drinking water. 400,000 households do not have toilet facilities. And I think what is really tragic is the number that follows, which is that one in four children under the age of five and one in 10 under the age of 15 die annually. And you can see, look at these brilliant smiles. These are the children that they never get to realize their potential because of an issue of sanitation, an issue that is easily solvable, and an issue that I think is easily solvable that we do not pay attention to. Let's look at how technology could have been used and has not been used over the years. Annual processes have not been working. You think about the bubonic plague, Black Death, claim the lives of between 75 and 200 million people, the Spanish flus between 17 and 100 million, smallpox over 12 million, cholera over a million, and the pandemic that we're currently living in and currently experiencing and why some of you are wearing masks. Officially, they say 5 million. Some experts disagree with that figure and say it's closer to 19 million. Why have we not innovated in public health? Why have we not created the technologies that allow us to address modern crises there are, before I get into some of the, the companies and some of the organizations that are doing some good work in that space, I will talk about some other spaces where technology has had significant impact. Women's menstrual health, this is great. Two apps, Clue and Flow, they've done very well, over 100 million users that allow women to keep track of the menstrual cycles, keep the details. I see some women in here, I'm not going to ask you if you use those apps, but I think um, this is a wonderful technology as far as I understand. We have telemedicine and telehealth, as I asked some of you whether you use it. Over 150 million people accessed telehealth and telemedicine apps in April of 2020 alone. And Bain & Company has released some figures that shows an upward trend in the use of some of these technologies. So we are actually using technologies for services that are referred to as public goods. Being able to go to a hospital, having access to a doctor is actually a public good. These are some of the figures that released by Bain that shows uh, the trajectory, current and future, and we see that it's moving up with 164% for telemedicine. That's pretty significant across Asia. And these numbers aren't reflective over only of Asia. Uh, the trend is pretty much reflected in other regions around the world. So the big question is who own these technologies, the digital technologies that we are becoming dependent on for improved quality of life? I think an even more important question is, how can we develop these digital solutions that maximizes utilities of entire populations in equitable ways? And, you know, economists, we think about utilities in, in terms of happiness. What makes you happy? How can you derive happiness? There are some organizations that are rethinking how technology is being used to address uh, public challenges. ITGH, is my organization, the Institute for Technology and Global Health at Patrick Foundation, which uh, I hope that you would have heard about earlier. ESA is the European Space Agency and the Broad Institute. I think if you're based in Boston or maybe anywhere in the US, you would have heard of the Broad Institute. ITGH, we think about these challenges. We, we approach it through applied research. We think about how to develop these innovative technologies. How do we implement them? How do we design and deliver policies that will guide their operations, but that will also protect individuals, which is important, and I will say a little bit about that later. One project that I am very excited about that we're currently working on in uh, the Itigwini municipality in uh, South Africa, or Durban, South Africa, 
we're using uh, satellites, two satellites provided by the European Space Agency to actively monitor ecological and environmental changes. So water chemistry, water density, the presence of aerosols in the atmosphere, all of the conditions that typically come together, they converge and allow diseases to propagate in communities. So we're paying attention to that using the satellites. We're gathering the data. And in parallel, we're placing IoT sensors in the sewage systems in the community. And those sensors are able to detect the presence of pathogens that shed in excreta, uh, so your sewage, your waste products, any vectors uh, that are present, those sensors will detect them. And the data from those sensors, in collaboration with the data from the environment, the, the Earth observation data, will provide us with information that can be used, or data that can be used to train AI that could then perform a predictive analysis and tell us when there's a, the possibility of an outbreak uh, prior to it happening. And so we're equipping health practitioners with the necessary information to make quick uh, decisions that could protect and save lives. The ESA, the European Space Agency, one of the supporters of the project I just talked about, they also are engaged in a number of incredible projects. So urban green, resilient utilities, water scarcity. And I think it's important because these projects are large scale and they, they benefit the entire community. It's not just the developed nations who are benefiting. It's not just the wealthy, but people who are in rural parts of the world are also able to benefit from this. And the Broad Institute, you know, doing remarkable work we live in this age of misinformation and disinformation, which is unfortunate. But what they're doing is they're tackling this issue through gamification um, and education of young people. And so when we have unfortunate situations when news networks uh, deliver false information um, or politicians uh, politicize pandemics and crises, uh, they have a scientific understanding of what pandemics are and how viruses work, how infectious diseases work. Uh, how vaccines work and can make their own informed decisions. So that's important. We're the people and we're the technology, or we're developing the technology, and I think we all should benefit. The key question here is, should these technologies be public goods? Public good is defined as a commodity or service that is available to all members of a society. So like law enforcement and access to clean water and national defense. And I would have hoped like factual news reporting and factual political statements. But malaprops might consider you socialist if you demand that, so we're not going to do that. So my, my thought is if we're publicly funding technologies, then we should all benefit. We should all derive benefits from it. And so, for example, when the federal government provides a biopharmaceutical company like Moderna $2.5 billion to develop vaccines for COVID, I just think that the entire community needs to benefit from it and they should not retain IP rights. This is at a time when you have over 5,000 people dying daily from not having access to vaccines internationally. So, and then what about the protections for individuals? We hear stories about Facebook and Amazon and Google and Apple and how they misuse data. Allegedly, Facebook's own uh, researchers found out that there was psychological damage to young girls using Instagram and they buried it, allegedly. And so if it's a public good, then it's regulated and they're not able to do that. So we need to start thinking about, as we all start using technologies more often in our daily lives, how do we regulate it to ensure that we're protected, that our uh, data, our personal information isn't misused. But who gets to implement it? This is very interesting because my colleague, well, it's not really my colleague, he's actually a faculty at uh, Harvard Business School, but we, we both work with the Institute for Technology and Global Health. We ran a national survey early in the year to try to understand whether people trusted the government or not in relation to the use of digital credentials. That was very insightful because what we found is that people would like to use digital products. They would like to use these digital tools, like uh, immunity passes, by the way, digital credentials, but they do not trust the federal government to be the ones to implement it. Nor do they trust big tech to be the ones to develop it. They do trust, however, the public health departments, local health departments, and they do trust universities. They do trust academic departments. This is great because you have organizations like PathTech Foundation who are developing these tools as nonprofits and who are distributing them for free, by the way, usually. And so why are we not thinking about these relationships a little bit more? Why are we not thinking about public academic partnerships as a, instead of public private partnerships? And so there's nowhere to run. The reports, we get them almost every day, how Facebook and Google and Apple misuse our data, misuse our information, and yet we continue to use it. It's kind of you know, cathartic to swipe through and see what people are up to, 
swipe left or right. So we're not going to stop, but we do need to regulate it. And we, need, we do need to make sure that everyone is benefiting, that there's equity. And so how to make technology and innovation public goods? Well, I talked about this before. If it's publicly funded, if our tax paying dollars fund research that go on to develop technologies, then we should all benefit from it. I think that's fair, isn't it? If I develop something in a lab at MIT, MIT owns it because they paid for it, right? It's their resources. If I develop it in a lab at Harvard, they own it. I don't get to retain IP. And so I think it should be the same thing at the public level. I close with saying that technology isn't going anywhere. We are an innovative species. I don't think we should stop. I think this is excellent. But as we develop, we do need to think about creating equal opportunity for access and benefit for everyone. Thank you.